Now, I would like to ask two of the hardest working people I know working towards zero with the least amount of ego, pettiness, and selfishness to join me on the stage. I'm delighted to let you know that effective immediately, Dave Mayer is our CEO. I'm also delighted to announce that Dr. Mike Ramsey is our incoming chair and will become the chairman of the Board of Patient Safety Movement Foundation at our 2020 summit. When I started this movement, I could have only dreamed of having Dave and Mike become the leaders of Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Mike and Dave don't need introductions, but I'll briefly tell you what they're doing today. First of all, Dr. Dave Mayer, who I told you was the architect, or one of the architects, he was very humble, of the CANDOR program, is right now the president of, uh, executive director of MedStar Institute of Quality and Safety. And Dr. Mike Ramsey, who's the chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology, and pain management at Baylor University Medical Center and the president of Baylor Scott and White Research Institute. You also may know the Ramsey name from the Ramsey sedation scale. I've been in meetings where people have asked for his autograph. Mike and Dave, would you please join me for a chat? Please come on up. I'm gonna ask you each to just make a few comments, but then I wanna ask you some questions, and if any of you have any questions, please send it to me. I will look for them here, and we'll ask them. Mike, do you wanna go first? Sure, I just wanna make uh, one comment, and that was as I walked in here this morning, uh, Joe noticed my tie was crooked, and uh, <laughs> Sarah Keani actually straightened it. <laughs> and, and as I walked away, I thought, how does Sarah know anything about ties? <laughs> I, I never wear one. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> I think, uh, Joe, uh, we've really got to thank you. Um, when you think about it, getting down to zero lives lost, you think for every life that's lost, there's probably a thousand patients that have avoided harm. So if you start to look at how we've prevented harm in the healthcare system, it's enormous. And. Uh, as we look at where this organization's gone, we've gone from the US, 200,000 lives, we're global. We've got representatives here now from many countries around the world, Mexico, Australia, Europe, uh, Taiwan, Japan. I mean, it's phenomenal. Everybody's got on board, and uh, it's your drive that's got us there. You've looked at this sort of ecosystem of healthcare, which uh, is brilliant in terms of you're not looking at a doctor or a hospital. You're looking at a patient, a patient's family. You're looking at high-tech companies, a patient, patient's family. You're looking at politicians, media, patient, patient's family. You put all that together, and suddenly you've got the energy, you've got the input from everybody who's got a stake in this. And uh, that's what's made this so successful, and it really has been a successful movement. Sure, there's a lot, lot more work to be done, and we're gonna do it. But I think you've got off to a tremendous start. I know 2020's next year, but look how this movement is vibrant and it's going across the globe. And uh, we're gonna, we have a lot, lot more work to do. So thank you, Joe, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess I'll have to start taking the tie off. <laughs> I can wear a tie, you know, I can wear a tie. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. It's such an honor to have worked with you for all these years, and I'm just delighted that you're going to take on the chairman role next year. Um, I, I can just imagine the wonderful things you're going to do. Uh, Dave? Well, yeah, you can see I've already adopted the tieless look. So <laughs> I learn quickly. You know, I joke with my family. I went into anesthesia because I just wanted to wear pajamas to work every day. I didn't <laughs> want to wear a tie, but uh, very comfortable with that one. But first, I, I just got to um, thank you for this honor. And, and uh, I'm totally honored and 
humbled uh, to follow in your footsteps and, and what you've done. It's a big challenge. But I think we all owe Joe Chiani a big round of thank you and applause for his vision and leadership in creating this patient safety movement seven years ago. It was truly um, something different, and I'll share a little bit about that. I always say, I wish we had 50 Joe Chianis in the world who were doing what Joe did. The healthcare world would be so much better with people with vision and urgency. Um, Joe did create urgency. He put a bold statement out there of zero by 2020. That took a lot of guts, but it created urgency. As you heard me say in the video, putting a man on the moon in the 1950s, 10 years earlier than you thought we did, um, <laughs> was also that. created. That was all a fake, Joe. We did it 10 years earlier, but they just sort of... It was of, planned. It was planned that way. But no, that was sort of the bold stake. And, and I remember even... Don Berwick, many years ago, another great visionary leader who put out a bold statement that we're going to save 100,000 lives in 18 months. And, and that created action. That created urgency. I don't know about you, but I've been doing this work for too long, and I'm sort of tired of trying to PowerPoint it away, trying to go, hear somebody talk, and then go back. This is an organization about commitments. And, and so I thank you for raising that urgency. Um, I, I know many, if not all of you, in the audience, and I know how passionate you are about this and how committed, and the work you're doing is great. But as Joe said, we can't lose that urgency. We must maintain it, and zero must be the only number. I loved how you set it up there at the podium, on the screen, because one is still way too many. So I look forward to working with all of you over the coming years, and let's really make this a reality. Let's really continue that urgency that Joe instilled in us, which makes this organization so different from, I believe, others. So thank you. And, thank you, Dave. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much. I, I like what you said about it being an honor, because unfortunately, you're both not getting paid anything for doing this, which yeah, is a tradition that will continue, I hope. <laughs> Because, uh, because uh, we can put the money into so many other mm -hmm. usage. Uh, but I want to thank you both. Um, and I want to ask you, uh, you know, what, what's, your, what's your agenda going to be? What's, yours, uh, what's your plan? What do you want to do? I'll start with you, Dave, and maybe Mike. You could, you could talk about no, it. I, Hopefully I, it's shared by the two of you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, Joe, I, I've been involved with you for the full seven years, and it's been an honor. Um, so many of the things you have instilled and believed in in this organization are things that I believe are critical to the success of achieving zero preventable deaths. First, you brought the patient and family members into the room from day one, and, and friends of mine have heard me say this many years now. I've learned more from patients and family members about how to improve quality and safety in my role uh, as a leader in, in different organizations than I have from my contemporaries. So I thought that was wonderful, and, and the stories and their involvement in panels was, was something that was very important to me. Two, you talked about transparency, and, and I'll share more in the, the panel this afternoon, but that is key. Somebody in the, I forgot who it was, in the patient and family meeting, breakfast meeting this morning said, you know, it's about transparency, it's about learning from the events and the accountability to enforce change to improve that environment. And that was so right on. And so I believe, as you know, in the transparency model, education has always been dear to my heart, and I love the work that's been done around the curriculum. We struggled for 20 years to try to change the environment in medical schools and nursing schools. Nursing schools have been, I think, way ahead of us in, 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 uh, compared to medical schools with the CUSIN project and other things they've done. But if we don't, you know, many of you know, I said many years ago at a panel, when asked what was the one thing, if I could say in one sentence, what would change and create a better safety environment, I said educate the young and regulate the old. <laughs> uh, got me in a little trouble with some of the members of the audience. <laughs> but, but I really believed in that. If you want to change culture like aviation and nuclear energy did, you've got to instill the competencies, the knowledge, and the skills in this new generation so they come equipped much better than Mike's and my generation ever 
we're trained in quality and safety. So those are certain elements that I am very keen on and want to make sure that we all continue to move forward. Well, the, the CANDOR program mm -hmm. that you helped architect, I, I call that healthcare 2.0. I, I, I love what you're doing, and I hope that becomes embedded in the patient safety movement. You know, recently, we were meeting with Senator Maggie Hassan, and she said something that I, that I love. She said, when are we going to treat every patient's death the way we treat an airplane crash instead of a car accident? And to me, the CANDOR program is exactly that. It's treating every death as a plane crash that you gotta learn from instead of a car accident that we just think, well, it happens. Yeah, imagine, you know, again, I'll, I'll expound on these a little more in the panel this afternoon, but imagine if we left a plane sitting on a runway for four weeks and said, you know what, we're just too busy to get out there and understand what happened. That's what we do with patients and family members. We say, you know what? We're really busy to, we got to go back to work, but we got some time three weeks, four weeks from now to start thinking about doing a root cause analysis. I know we never showed that urgency to the patients and families many years ago, and, and we learned these are plane crashes in their lives, and we've got to respond the same way the NTS, NTSB responds in, in all the elements of learning, support, finance, whatever it is. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ramsey? I think uh, we've got to make our hospital safe. And right now, when a patient comes into hospital with an illness, they're frightened, they're nervous, and they want to get to the safe place, but the safe place is home. It's not the hospital. And we've got to change that. And I think we are. I think this movement started that change. The hospitals are, in general, getting safer. You know that nurse coming in, that doctor coming in, has actually washed their hands before they touch you. I was a patient in the hospital. I made sure that happened, and uh, I think they were very glad to see me leave, but uh, it, it embedded in how serious it is. And uh, now, if we get, for instance, a central line infection, it's just as you talked about, it's like a plane crash. Why did we get it? And when you start to take, it's, uh, I forget which number app it is now for the Clabsy, but um, we've got ours down for the last three months to zero. The only ones that we get are ones that get transferred into the hospital. So we can get down to zero. It's possible. Respiratory depression from the result of opioids. We haven't had a death in nine years because we've instituted everything that's in that app number four. And uh, do we get respiratory depression still? Yes, we do. But it's early. We pick it up early. We get it treated. Patients don't have to go to the ICU. They're not at risk. Well, everybody's at risk. I'll take that back. But um, we've got measures in place that make it much, much less risk. And so th that's an impact of this movement, is an impact of what these apps can do. And I'd really implore everybody, read them and take them back to your institution, take them back to your healthcare uh, folk and ask them, could you do this? Could you institute this in your facility? And if you can't, why not? If you've got something better, and if you've got something better, bring it to us so that we can look at it and see if it is better, and if it is, then we can change it. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Where is the seven actionable, pay, the seven objectives? Let's put those up on the board. I want to talk about them. We call them guiding principles sometimes. Sometimes we call them the objectives. If you guys could put that on the screen. Um, what about the transparency and aligned incentives? Tell, tell, me, tell me your thoughts and your take on what we should do about that. I loved your comment uh, about uh, the children's hospital out here and aligning incentives. Uh, look, it's done in every other industry where performance is you know, based on incentives. And if the incentive as it is today is to do more volume versus do higher quality, that drives the measures. And while we talk about moving from quantity to quality, it hasn't occurred as quickly as many of us has hoped. So, I think if you, don't, if you don't hold yourself accountable, uh, there's a great line, the best way to starve a pet is to tell two people to feed it. You know, it, you get to the point where no one owns it, and, and we found historically that unless you own it, you know, no one's accountable, and, and um, that's where the transparency and accountability is so important. 
Mike? I think accountability is changing. I know we're now taking on big contracts with different organizations where we're taking the risk of taking care of those patients. So if we don't do a good job, it is going to cost us. And so there's a financial input now to make our hospitals better quality, safer, and uh, partner with the patients to get them through this in, in good shape. And that's where I think uh, we're getting to. So I think that's getting the politicians and the payors involved in this, as well as just healthcare workers and uh, administration. I'm not aware of one of the actual patient safety solutions that will actually increase costs. Even though they're gonna save lives, to the best of my knowledge, every one of them actually reduces costs too. I mean, are you, would you, would you, anyone would, you, would disagree with that? Well, I, I think Deming was right for many years and, and you improve the quality, you lower the cost of what you do. And I think there's great examples of that in healthcare even today. So. Yeah, you improve quality, reduce risk, you see better value. How much did MedStore save since implementing Candor? Well, we've been uh, seeing tremendous reductions. I'll save that for Larry Smith to okay. share. Larry right. Smith, right. our, our <laughs> risk officer, is on a panel, uh, and I don't want to steal any of his thunder, but it's been huge. I'll tell you, at University of Illinois, when we implemented the seven pillars, there was an article published just over a year and a half ago on those results talking about less claims, um, shortened time to resolution, and at University of Illinois, we saved over $100 million in seven years. Wow. Yeah. I want to review these with you and just get your thoughts about every one of them. <laughs> so we're going to go one by one, because I want to know if we are sharing uh, as these goals as yours. Uh, one, unify the healthcare ecosystem. Hospitals, healthcare technology companies, government agencies, policymakers, patient advocates, clinicians, engineers, payers, everybody. What, what's your thought, Mike? Well, I think it's happening. It's just, as, as I was saying, I think now uh, politicians have got into it. I think payors, which is much more important to the hospital, have got into it. And you're going to get paid for quality work. And uh, you're going to take on that risk. And that's going to make us all better. And the patients are going to do better. And so I think uh, pulling everything together there, plus, you know, instead of having six boxes in the OR and we're looking at this monitor, this monitor, this monitor, we've got them now starting to talk together. So now we've got even artificial intelligence coming in saying, this patient's blood pressure is going to drop in 15 minutes unless you do something. You're getting ahead of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but speaking of pairs, uh, we have insurance companies that are willing to give discounts to hospitals that have implemented the apps. We need your help with one document. See Ariana, if you can help us, there's a document we need uh, that from your hospitals, one of them that's not self-insured, that could get these insurance companies running. But yes, payers wanting to incentivize, wanting to pay. I'll even add to that, that in this state, Beta Health, which is a large you know, med mail carrier for hospitals, I think roughly about 250, has put incentives in, so for any hospital that implements the five components of CANDOR in the CANDOR toolkit, they get a 10% reduction in their medical malpractice costs because they know that the program will bring great benefits to both the hospital as well as to the insurance company. Wonderful. So that's a great alignment. But you know, to the bullet one, we should never compete on safety. There are other things we could compete on across health systems, across what you've done in technology of trying to line the companies. We should never, aviation never competes on safety. Have you ever seen a commercial that says we are safer than this? Yeah. It happened once and they shut that commercial down. So um, they understand, they'll compete on other things, but they share everything about safety. Well, I, I totally believe when it comes to patient safety, we have to put the competition aside and work together. I think you can see the benefactor on this list yeah. is my main competitor, Medtronic. Mm -hmm. And I'm very glad that they joined. Omar Ishraq, uh, yeah. I think he's a visionary to step forward and, and join in here. Uh, but I do believe that we should get our, well, we'll get to, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, number two, identify the challenges that are killing patients and create actionable solutions we call them apps to mitigate them. Do we have more to go? Are there more apps we need to create? Do we just need to take the ones we have right now and improve them? 
No, I think we're going to, I, I think we've hit the major ones, but I think uh, we're going to have more input from people and uh, as more and more people get involved in this movement and they're going to say, what about this? What about that? Couldn't we do a better job here? And I think as we show success with the ones we've got, we'll fine tune them and then we'll, we'll, we'll get more. And then I think actually we'll, we'll move more into the preventing harm as much as preventing death because I think uh, that's incredibly important as well. I, I think we still got to do a lot of work around systems and processes. I never met anybody who comes to work each day in a hospital or a clinic that wants to harm somebody. Uh, I mean, they're devastated. You talk to people who have been involved in a catastrophic event, and it really wasn't, you know, to err as human, as, as we say, and you brought up. It's, I always said, because I didn't put the right process and system to protect that healthcare provider. At that time, they made a decision that I probably would have made if I were in their situation based on the environment they were working in. So if we don't figure out how to change those systems and processes, and it's a whole redesign, um, again, we'll talk about it this afternoon, but we can't continue to put Band-Aids on and, and, and think we're making remarkable changes. We, we've really got to redesign how we provide healthcare. Love that. And, and, and you're right. We are, look, we're looking at delirium now. I think the right. ASA yeah. brought to our attention delirium is a serious problem, yeah. and we're looking at that as uh, hopefully the next apps that we'll create. Um, ask hospitals to implement the apps, all of them. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that one? I think it's something we've got to do, but I think they've got to listen to us, and uh, that's hard. I think uh, we've got to have advocates coming from lots of different directions. That's why I think everybody here has got to help us move the needle. They've got to come in and ask their hospital administration, ask their physicians, ask their nurses, what are you doing? Look, here's a list of apps that are out there that have been proven to save lives. Why are you not instituting them? And, and uh, it's not that easy to get people to listen because I think there's a certain barrier that they feel like, well, we don't, we don't make mistakes in our hospital and we've got, to, you know, we, we've got to be transparent. We've got to bring out uh, when these things happen. Yeah. Dave? I, I think it's leadership. You know, it starts at the top and if you don't have the leadership in place to embrace. I mean, Peter's here today, Peter Pronovos, the central line bundle. You know, it still amazes me that some people don't follow something that is evidence-based and proven to get to zero preventable harms. Ventilator associate, we've no certain things that will get us to zero in those areas. You know, to your point, shame on us for not implementing them and driving those numbers to zero in those areas. Some of the other areas, the culture and things, they're a little more tough to challenge, and uh, it took aviation 20 years to change their culture. Um, but we can't wait 20 years. We've been on this well, journey we have waited. Way too long. I hate the word We've... journey. It's just I'm too old for journeys. <laughs> I, want, I want the urgency now. It's, we can't continue to, to say we're on this journey, and no, it's why I love your urgency. Well, and we've been on this journey for 30 years. Yeah. And, okay, maybe 20 from the IOM report, but. I don't know if you've read that book, The Great White Lie by Walt Bogdanich. It's, it's, it's incredible. The same thing's still happening. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, and I know we're kind of jumping maybe to promoting transparency and aligned incentives. I mean, is, I feel like we've got the group here, many that are not here today, that are part of this movement, but that's a fraction of the hospitals. Do we need ministers of health? Do we need legislators to mandate uh, aligned incentives and uh, transparency. I think if the payers get in line and buy off on all this, and we, we, we saw Patrick Conway there was on one of those videos from when he was with CMS, I think that makes an enormous difference. Once they come in and say, we want these measures of quality in place, or we're not going to pay you. That's a powerful incentive. Unfortunately, money seems to be more powerful than losing lives, but um, we, we, we that unfortunately is, is, is where we are, and uh, that's a big driver. But fortunately, I know, I know in our hospital administration, they're very focused now on preventing harm. 
And uh, you know, every week we have best care meetings. Every week we're looking at numbers. We're looking at mortality rates. We know having done the sepsis bundle, that our sepsis mortality rate is way down. It made a big difference, and we can prove it. And I think that's what we've got to start expecting from every hospital. Show us the numbers. Yeah, show us the numbers. Because data speaks. Yes. Yes, and while we don't want to compete on patient safety in a negative way, where we take confidential information on patient safety from another hospital and use it against them, because we want to share that, I think it's totally fine that patient safety is displayed prominently at the doors and websites of hospitals listing how many preventable harms they've had so that consumers can learn where they want to go. But more importantly, each one of us have to look in the mirror and say, do we want that? Do we want it to go lower? What do we do about it? I think that kind of a competition is a healthy competition uh, and one that we should, we should uh, be pushing for. Uh, do you want to add anything to that? No, thing? I think you covered it. Um, ask healthcare, healthcare technology companies to share their data. Uh, this is not internal data. This is data their products are purchased for that's being displayed uh, because we know that human beings have a tough time processing historical data and coming up with an answer, but computers are great at it. So to have, a com to have them share the data, we think it will revolutionize uh, the process of finding the problems and the, you know, making sure you're acting based on all the information. So w what do you think about that? I'm excited about Baxter joining. We didn't have an infusion pump company. I think that'll now hopefully steer the others to do it, spur the other ones to do it. Because you know, one of the things we've always said, and my co competitors have shared their data, so this is not self, uh, self uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, promoting. Yeah. But I urge hospitals to not buy products from companies that don't share their data. Because we, I want everyone to eventually share their data so that that doesn't become a competitive issue. <laughs> so what's your thoughts on sharing data? Well, I, I think it's critical. Uh, I mean, w without it, we're sort of operating without 100% of the information. You know, Mike touched on the predictive analytics and, and, and artificial intelligence. I, I don't know, you know, for the physicians and nurses in the audience, I don't know, I, I never learned how to use an ophthalmoscope, and I'm trying to look to see if I could see, you know, retinal injuries and diabetic changes. Why? We've got computers. Even ophthalmologists sometimes have tough times picking it up with predictive analytics and now with artificial intelligence, you could get all the answers that you need and thus make better choices for the patient versus trying to do it all. So I think those types of tools that help support us, we talked about sepsis, I mean that's the alert bundles and nurse activated protocols, we don't need a physician to call and you know, try to reach for three hours to start sepsis treatment. The, the predictive models are showing that this patient has hit the risk factors. Let's just start treatment and, and we'll tell the doctor when they eventually call back. Those are the types of things that are starting to show some great success. Anything you want to add to that? No, I think, uh, I think that's the area we're in now, which is, which is helpful to clinicians, particularly when you're in a high activity area like an operating room or an ICU to be able to have uh, something to pull together all the data that you're getting uh, and make sense of it and alert you in advance of something bad happening, that's a tremendous help, tremendous. I mean, when you look where we see we are now, I mean, just take something a little bit different, like breast cancer. Now there's a computer that can pick up breast cancer on a scan better than the human eye. That's what we want. We want computers to be better than us to give us the information so that we can intervene earlier than we would do if we're using our intellect. Yeah. In the areas computers can be better. In many areas they can't be, but in those sure. areas they can. Yeah. You look at what it's done in aviation. I mean, you talk to pilots. I, I, I've studied aviation my whole career because I think there's such a wonderful learning from them. But you talk to pilots today and they'll tell you they're not pilots anymore. They're risk mitigation experts. The planes could fly themselves. We know that with drones. I mean, so. What they're there for is to understand risk that is coming into a system that maybe the computers or the autopilot aren't capable of sensing. 
and to make the adjustments that need. And pilots used to hate autopilot when it first came out. Now many of them love it because it allows them to focus in on the most important things and get rid of the mundane, boring stuff that they, got, they thought was tedious after a while. So we've got to start thinking more like that, I believe. And it's possible. Sorry on that, if I can, just yeah. please, please. I went down to Australia last year, and uh, I got a chance to get into the cockpit of a 380 and looked at all the instruments that were there, and there was only one thing that moved. There was this one stick sitting there by my right hand. So I said, so what does this stick do? And he just looked at me and he said, push it forward, houses get bigger, yeah. pull it back, houses get smaller. <laughs> <laughs> John Nance line. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, uh, I want to just hit the last two. Uh, promote patient dignity and love. It's what it's all about. I mean, it's... Um, Carol Hemelgarn has taught me it's the patient first, last, and everything in between. And I love that quote of hers, and, and that's what it's about. Uh, Berwick has been wonderful in the stories he shares about we are guests in their life, they are not guests in our life. And, and um, once we adopt those principles and embrace them, uh, I think we'll be a lot closer to that zero by 2020. I think the problem is, though, that we put work pressure on nurses, physicians as well. You've got so many patients to see. You get this patient out of this room. By 10 o'clock, we can get you another very sick patient in in an hour. Um, and it starts to distance you from the fact this is a human being. This is somebody that you've got to love. This is somebody you've got to be there to help. And uh, it's not a commodity. And yet the work pressures drive us in that direction. And we have to be able to pull back a little bit. And this is number one, the patient. Yeah. And patients know so much about their own health and their families know so much about them that when we don't give them that love and that dignity, they can't help us. They shut down. They're afraid to speak up. Last but not least, educate providers, young <laughs> and old, health professionals, and training patients and families about patient safety. Well, it's, it's been my passion. Um, you know, many in the audience know we started the Telluride Patient Safety Roundtable for medical students, nursing students, and resident physicians 15 years ago. We had experts come together, create a curriculum, and it was around transparency and open and honest communication being the key. Um, patients and families teach side by side with us at, this, uh, at these camps. Uh, we're now up to six a year. We do four in the US. We do one in Sydney, Australia, and one in Doha, Qatar with the same curriculum. And we've put over 1,200 future healthcare leaders through the, the curriculum. It's a week-long immersion. It's supported. There are scholarships so that it's all free for the students and residents, but it, it's scholarships by medical malpractice companies of all people because they believe if you educate the young, you will lower risk later and will make everybody um, better off and stuff. And I love the emails I continue to get from these kids who went through seven, eight years ago and now they're chief nursing officers and they're quality and safety officers. We've got a wonderful girl from uh, Dignity here who went through our camp two years ago and she's up here gonna make a commitment. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's the heart of what I, I do and it's why I, I love education. I just echo that. I mean, we've got the American Society of Anesthesia here. We've got the European Society of Anesthesia here. The Mexican uh, College of Anesthesiologists are here. I've been down there talking. It's about safety, and these big organizations are putting safety number one. That's why they're co-convening this uh, operation today. I think that that's a signal that uh, finally safety is uh, really in the forefront, and that's where we need it to be. Uh, I'm very excited at number seven, that this year we're introducing the yeah. curriculum. Mm -hmm. Great curriculum. I really believe uh, the trick with the curricula and the challenge to the team was to make it something that everyone could implement. Yeah. As I know there's been others, but they get put on the shelf. It's hard to use them. Yeah. And I hope you'll agree that what these gentlemen and ladies have created is something that can be used. Yeah. I'd like to see us as an organization um, go to the LCME, um, start changing. We always say assessment drives the curriculum. 
And until the board start putting questions on the national board exams and the LCME accreditations of medical schools still start asking for what the curriculum is around quality and safety, otherwise we're not gonna accredit you as a medical school. It, it's like trying to change culture in hospitals when you don't have effective leadership. So uh, the curriculum is great. Now we've just gotta make sure that the regulators regulate it and bring it as a mandate into medical schools and nursing schools. Right. Well, we have several questions from the audience. So I want to ask you some of them. One of them was then I was going to ask too. I'm glad you're asking it. And I can't tell who's asking it, but I'm going to say the first one. Is there going to be a new goal tied to the mission after 2020 passes? Or are we going to be bold enough to do zero by or some other goal after the 2020 passes? Well, I'll get into that a little bit. I think you've started something now that initially was the United States. Now it's global. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's an enormous task. And, uh, but you've got, it, you've got a vibrant organization. We've got to keep that alive. We've got to keep it dynamic. And we've got to make the globe a safer place. And we've got to make medicine and health care across the world safer. And uh, I think what you've started is just mushrooming, and we've just got to keep that drive going. And um, it's going to be a challenge, absolutely, but we can do it. We can do it. What do you think, Dave? I, you know, you said it well in regards to one is just way too much, and we've got to figure out how that's aligned and, and how we come up with a statement that continues to create the urgency. And if we got to put another stake in the ground, um, We'll put it there, but I think we've got to be, it's the urgency, we can't lose that, and we've got to be bold. I've got one question for you, and I'm sure there are many, it's sure it's on there. How are you going to remain within this organization that you've built and nurtured? Because we can't do it without you. And I know you're going to stay on the board, but I would think many people want to know, what are you going to continue to do to help Mike and I? <laughs> <laughs> I know the answer already, but I just wanted to. <laughs> well, I'm not leaving. I'm not quitting, but I really. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I really felt, for many reasons, including the goal of patient safety, but with the mission, it was good for it to have a new leadership. This cannot be about me. Uh, it never was. It was about the mission. And I think by the two of you coming in, it reinforces that this is about the mission, and I'm gonna help you like everybody else here, like the two of you helped me. I'm, I'm here at your disposal, and I'm dedicated to this. Uh, whatever goal we pick, it's mine as much as it's yours. So zero by 2025? <laughs> zero by 2030? Do I have a taker? Yeah, what do you guys think? If, you guys? Should we do another bold goal like that? Zero by 2030, 2025? Raise your hand if you think we should do it. All right, so what is it? Raise your hand if by 2025, it has become global. 2030. <laughs> do I hear 35? No. I think I got more hands at 2025. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So we should. Because it does need urgency. It does. It can't be a journey. The journey started 30 years ago. We got to get to the end. And you know, I've, I've said this before, many companies, many people here are from companies that make things like mine. If we have a failure rate like this, we stop the line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we don't manufacture until we figure out what's happening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, elective surgeries shouldn't be happening until the hospital have put together all the apps. At minimum, I'm not saying the apps are gonna be the cure for all, but it's the minimum thing we can do. Yeah. And safety measures have got to be hardwired into every hospital. Yeah. Absolutely. I got another one. Richard Branson's office says, take care of your employees and they will take care of your customers. How can we better care for our providers to improve patient outcomes? Right on. I mean, that's a perfect statement. Um, like I said, so many times we put people, Mike talked about the pressures of 
running faster, jumping higher, and, and, and doing more, and, and the stress that's called. Look, we've got, everybody in this audience knows it. I mean, 400 physicians in the US commit suicide every year. That's two medical schools that basically are wiped out from the stress and the burnout. Nurses' suicide rates are higher than the general population. Uh, Lucian Leap many years ago said, we've got to bring joy and meaning back into the workplace. So how do you celebrate people with good catch programs? How do you put in care for the caregiver programs and support? Most of the care for the caregiver programs, for those that uh, you know this already, if you have them, they're not responding all the time to just patients who have been harmed unintentionally but preventably, they're responding to their colleagues and their partners who maybe worked with a patient for seven, eight days and got to know the family and forever the illness lost that patient. That's stressful. That takes a lot out of you. I don't know how many saw the, the photo that went viral about two years ago of an ER physician who walked out of a trauma unit after trying to save a 17-year-old who was in a motorcycle accident. The paramedic stayed around. They worked on the boy for 90 minutes, and they lost it. And this ED doc just walks across the street, kneels down, and starts crying. And then has to get back up five minutes later and go back in and deal with another trauma event. I mean, the stress we put our caregivers on. So um, we've got to bring joy in meeting, we've got to bring respect, and we've really got to support the teams because if you don't take care of associate safety, I, again, I don't know if people realize, but being a caregiver is the most dangerous job you could have. More than a construction worker with needle slit, sticks, falls, Larry Smith leads our associate safety program and does an amazing job, but we're seeing those numbers come down because we're focused not only on patient safety, but associate safety. Mike? I think there's no doubt we have to be accountable. And uh, I think everybody understands that in the healthcare uh, profession. But when you make a mistake, why did the mistake happen? And, and I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, we have to look at what was the process? because it's incredibly stressful. Did somebody make the mistake because they were just lazy? Possible, and that's the accountability part. But we have to look at the process and say, why did that mistake happen? Was the, was the drug labeling not correct? Was, was there some process that we could change to make things safer and stop that mistake happening? That's what the airline industry did. You know, a pilot can come back and report a near miss, and provided he reports and he did things correctly, uh, they'll look into it and try and make a correction. And we have to make healthcare safer from that perspective, that we all have tools that uh, are really very dangerous. And we're working under time constraints that make it even more dangerous. And we have to use processes to try and prevent that happening and make, uh, make the workplace safer for the provider. Last question to you two, then I'll ask you for your closing remarks. I know we're running a bit late, but we planned for this potentially. We gave you bigger breaks than ever before. So last question. Joe mentioned his frustration towards people with apathy, towards planning for zero. How do you think we can help or force clinicians and hospitals move away from apathy and towards action? Don't pay for apathy. <laughs> Don't pay for apathy. I like that. I like that. Regulate the old. You Regulate know, the old. <laughs> I'm a big believer in pay for performance. I think, you know, I've got enough gray hair through my years to see that when those measures were started to, you know, began to put in place, whether it was skip measures or core measures or whatever, they started changing people's culture. Back at University of Illinois, I couldn't get our ORs to get above 45, 50% of antibiotic skip compliance within the first hour of the city. You know, all the things that we knew were evidence-based. And the moment CMS made it a pay for performance measure, within six months we were up to 98%. And all of a sudden people took notice because they said, oh, we're gonna get penalized if I take the scalpel too quickly. So, uh, you know, I really believe there's gotta be a balance of education, driving, evidence-based practice, but the apathy only goes away when there's some incentive tied to that, either good or not good. I think you're right. 
Any closing remarks for the moment? I know you'll be back here again with us today and tomorrow. Yeah, no, just thank you for all you've done in creating this amazing global experience to listen to the people that are here and coming from all over the, the world. I mean, 10 people from Taiwan, it's a credit to you, Joe, and, and your credibility and your passion around this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. Let's just say we want the support of everybody in this room. Please, you've got to help us. Uh, we're going to move the needle together, uh, and let's get more people involved. Let's get more hospitals involved, uh, and let's make this a safer place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking this responsibility.